What's up, everyone? I recently had the honor to speak with Professor Matteo Bortolini on his work on the life of Robert Bella. I can't begin to express how meaningful and excited I was for this one. Robert Bella is one of my intellectual heroes in the field of sociology of religion, and he's had a tremendous impact on my thinking over the course of my studies all the way up to today. That said, Matteo is currently a professor of sociology in the Department of Philosophy, Sociology, Education, and Applied Psychology at Padova University in Northern Italy. His primary research interest is in the production of knowledge and social networks related to academic scholars, the history of the social and human sciences, political and critical theory, along with having very deep interest in the sociology of religion, as you will be hearing shortly. I hope you all enjoy our conversation, and like usual, make sure to check out the references and further reading material on my Medium page. Cheers. Like I was just saying, I'm super (laughs) excited and been reeling since I finished your book. So this is, uh, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so thank you for taking the time and, and coming and speaking oh, thank with me. You for, thank you for having me and thank you for reading the book. It's not, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a very good thing to, to meet the people who read the, the books, you know, you just Excellent. throw them, you just throw them outside and you never know what happens with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have Galen Watts to thank for that. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I, maybe that's kind of where I'll start. I mean, um, in terms of how I discovered your work, essentially, and obviously the biography on Robert Bella. Um, I graduated from Concordia University in religious studies in 2013. Um, and while I was there, I mean, uh, Robert Bella eventually came to have a huge impact on my studies and my thinking, uh, very much like Galen. I mean, I got exposed to his book. Uh, I didn't read Re- Habits of the Heart, but I essentially read his, uh, Robert, uh, Bella reader that eventually came out. And that's where I dived into his work. Um, and I'm forever grateful that I got exposed to his writing, uh, because I was having a really tough time. Um, trying to complete my degree in religious studies, to be honest with you. I was quite uh, disenfranchised, I guess, with the the approach that they were, you know, the whole field had kind of gone into. So discovering his writing was such, you know, uh, a shot of, of hope for me, um, you know, to, to, to just read his writing and be exposed to his way of understanding religion and my interest in East Asian religions, and particularly in, in, in Japan. Uh, so since I graduated, I mean, I've kind of fallen away from the field a bit, uh, but I try to keep a brace about what's kind of going on. And uh, luckily, I mean, uh, Galen's, uh, Watts work came across, uh, you know, uh, you know, I came across his work because of a few articles that he had collaborated with, with Matt McManus. Um, and they're quite political, I guess, in nature, but I mean, they're taking an approach, a broad sort of sociological approach and political approach where the idea of religion is kind of infusing their thinking as well. So once I saw, uh, Galen, uh, you know, eventually drop the, the, uh, the biography, I said to myself, oh, I'll have to get around to reading that. But he was coming up with his own book at the time as well. So I read his book this summer. And it just brought me back to Robert Bella, uh, you know, and I could feel his work throughout Galen's writing and his thinking as well. So that's what prompted me to go out and interview him. Um, so I'm so grateful to have <laughs> discovered your work. Well, I knew it was there, but now having finally had the opportunity to read it and uh, go back to Bella now since he's passed away, it's just been a uh, tremendous, particularly in this particular historical moment. Um, and your work, it just helped me connect so many dots, uh, you know, particularly from, you know, cause you go through the whole history of the rise of the social sciences, you know, in tandem with his life. Uh, it was just so helpful for me to go out and understand our political moment and even some of the sort of re- religious revival that we're witnessing and stuff like that. So I guess I'll just start off by thanking, thanking you again uh, for writing this book. It's been so tremendously helpful for me uh, to make sense of so many subjects and topics. 
Um, so, but obviously, I mean, the first thing that I want to talk to you about today is, you know, how did this project, you know, get kickstarted for you uh, originally? Like, how did you get exposed to Robert Bella's ideas? And, and when did you decide to go out and sort of write this book? So, uh, thank you again for, for the kind words. So, the, um, it, it's, uh, you know, the book, uh, my book begins exactly with a scene like this, uh, with somebody asking Bella, how did you start your project? And his answer, <laughs> his answer is something like, uh, I'm not the right person to answer to this question. And it's mysterious how these things happen. Uh, which I don't think it's true. Uh, I, I remember exactly how this project started. And um, so I'm a sociologist. Uh, I'm a sociologist uh, of ideas and intellectuals. So that means that I study uh, how expert knowledge is made mm -hmm. and the institutions that uh, help or hinder the creation of expert knowledge. So what I do is study, say, uh, academic institutions or, uh, you know, research foundations or groups or networks and try to understand how uh, intellectuals work and how intellectual work changes through time and, and also space because I'm uh, mostly specialized on the U.S. and, and Italy. So the beginning of the project was, uh, I, I just wanted, so I, I was, uh, when I was a kid, I w I mean, uh, at the university, uh, I really liked the work of uh, uh, an American sociologist from the 50s and the 60s, Talbot Parsons, mm, uh, yeah. who is now almost forgotten or something like that. And, um, and, and the interesting thing about Talbot Parsons is that he was really uh, hegemonic and a dominant figure in the 50s and the early 60s. And then after 68, uh, it was despised and attacked in all ways you can think of. And so my question at the beginning of this project was, uh, what happened to, to his students? So what happens to people who are very well connected and very publicly connected to a very famous and influential figure that falls from grace? Mm. What do they do? What do they do? So, um, so I, I selected some of his uh, best uh, students or most well-known students, and Robert Bella was one of them. Uh, another one was the great anthropologist Clifford Gertz. Mm. And uh, another one was a, a sociologist who worked mainly on uh, economics, whose name is Niels Melser. And I wanted to compare their careers and trajectories and ideas and see how they uh, they managed to cope with the fact that Parsons had fallen from grace. So that was my um, initial idea. But then uh, as I was working on that, I, I, I got really interested in trying to reconstruct uh, an individual story. Hmm. So the thing that I cannot underline enough is that as a sociologist, I, I was trained not to think in terms of individuals, you know, uh, the individual <laughs> is not interesting for, for, for sociologists. We study institutions, we study roles, we study social positions and expectations and norms and fields and uh, I don't know, whatever, uh, anything but individuals, you know, and, and so uh, I got more and more interested in the work of Robert Bella and in his life. And, but, but uh, before he died, I was not interested in his life as such. I was trying to reconstruct all the uh, professional and academic trajectory and career of Robert Bella. So I got to know him. We became very good friends. Uh, 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 in the second half of the uh, year 2000. I, I think I met him for the first time in 2007. So we, we traveled <laughs> together uh, for some time and I was at, uh, I got, I don't know, Thanksgiving with him at some point. 
and wow. uh, I got to know his family, his wife, and his daughters. And um, and then uh, exactly ten years ago, I was thinking about this uh, today. Uh, exactly ten years ago, uh, we traveled through the south of Germany for his last um, big uh, scholarly trip. In, in Germany in the November of 2012. So, and then he died. Uh, one, one year later, he died. So, um, but what I what I was writing, in fact, was a kind of a, a sociological biography. Mm -hmm. it didn't really delve into the his private, intimate life. Uh, it was very selective about his uh, his story as an individual because what I wanted to uh, to look at was exactly that his trajectory as an intellectual. So, I I I have I had like uh, two two hundred fifty pages of this book written when he died, and then uh, what happened is a uh, uh, I would say a funny story. It's not funny at all. <laughs> but so when he died, his daughters asked me if I wanted to go to Berkeley. And uh, have a look at his at the stuff that was there in the house. Yeah, yeah. because uh, I had been there many times, uh, but uh, one of the daughters wanted to move in, and she wanted to sell the books uh, and uh, decide what papers, to do with the stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and decide what to do. And she said, "Do you want to do that yourself, Matteo? Take any book you want." Uh, whatever, because I'm going to sell everything else. So, went to Berkeley at the, in December 2013 and started to do this this work. And then, at some point, I I I thought that there were a, a couple of people that I wanted to meet and I wanted to interview. But remember, at that point, the book was finished. Okay, so uh, I met with a, a Jesuit father. His name mm. is uh, John Coleman, and he was a friend of uh, of Robert Bella. And I met with this guy, and then very casually in the conversation, the guy told me, and then, you know, it was also important that Bella was gay. You know that. <laughs> uh, and I didn't know. I mean, yeah. I had been studying the guy for six or seven years and didn't know that. So uh, I, I pretended I, I knew. I said, okay. oh, yeah, so obviously talk me about that and tell me about that. Uh, <laughs> but then, uh, so I lied to a priest, uh, which is what you do all the time in Italy. But, uh, <laughs> so at that point, when the interview was over, I, I was in San Francisco. So I rushed back to Berkeley and I, and I uh, went to Bella's house on the Berkeley Hills. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a whole box of personal diaries that I I didn't really care about because I was writing another kind of book, you know. Yeah. But then at that point, I really had to read the diaries. So I read <laughs> like a pack of diaries. I, it took me all night. Okay. So I I, uh, I I just went to bed at six in the morning after reading all the diaries, and there was. So you read the book and you know yeah. about the story. And uh, the story looks so great and so interesting mm -hmm. that at that point, I said, oh, maybe I don't want to write that kind of dull uh, sociological, theoretical Take. book. I want to write a story. And wow. that's how. And, and so I, I took the 250 pages, throw them away, started again <laughs> from scratch. Wow. And, that's so interesting because, I mean, <clears throat> the other thing, too, is uh, about uh, Talcott Parsons. I mean, because his methodology is so, um, I mean, almost integral or almost holistic in terms of its approach. I mean, because, I mean, this is the other thing, too, that you speak about or touch upon is, is, is for agile subsystems and his approach that he takes to going out and studying I mean, all phenomenon, really, right? So it's interesting to me that you're really taking, you know, like his four subsystems very seriously in terms of how you went out and even studied Bella uh, as an individual. And to me, it's like, I mean, I think that's what the book is so riveting is that, I mean, it, it really fleshes out that sort of methodology 
that it's not just the cultural and the social institutions, but it's the individual actors within those particular systems as well, you know, and their rich interior lives and subjectivity, which is, you know, the basis of a lot of what Robert Bella was, was doing or interested in, in terms of his interest in, in religion as well. So, because, uh, I mean, your career is really interesting as well here. I mean, I just want to lay this out because you wrote your first book in terms of Italian sociology. So you studied the whole history of, of the social sciences uh, within, the, within the Italian context. So that's where you got exposed, obviously, to talk of Parsons' approach, essentially, if I understand correctly. That's when you really got interested in his work. Uh, so... Um... Almost. So, because I, I studied with an Italian sociologist here, who was my supervisor for my PhD and whatever. His name is Pierpaolo Donati and is around 75 now. And, and he was a, a real fan of Talcott Parsons. Okay. Uh, like a late fan of Talcott Parsons. And it, uh, this guy Donati used a version of the, of the four function scheme mm -hmm. as uh, his main tool for uh, for doing sociology and sociological interpretation. So I got interested in Talcott Parsons when I was very young and it was very strange because, you know, Parsons writings are very difficult and nobody really cares about them in mm -hmm. uh, today's sociology. So it was very strange for me to start studying that stuff. And uh, my, my first book, in fact, in Italian, was published in 2005, and it was a, what I call a theoretical fiction about Talcott Parsons. It was a, a, an entire book on Talcott Parsons. Oh. And, it, and it, it's called a theoretical fiction because uh, um, it's like uh, I will try to make sense of everything that Parsons wrote uh, and I don't care if you really thought what I'm writing, but I'm trying to give you a coherent picture and make sense of a lot of things. Okay, so uh, I studied I studied that kind of um, uh, agile scheme uh, very very closely, and uh, I I think I I I know the stuff pretty well, and um, and the. The interesting thing about uh, Parsons students was that most of them learned the stuff as a kind of uh, uh, a framework or a heuristics for studying everything. And even when they do not use the words or the concepts or they don't explicitly talk about the scheme and talk about Parsons, you can really see their minds working uh, with that template, you know what yeah, I mean. So, totally. and 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 Bella was a guy that was so good at doing that. Another one was Clifford Getz. Okay. Clifford Getz. Uh, uh, so I, I I've got one of my best friends, uh, an Ita terrific Italian sociologist whose name is Andrea Cossu, who is uh, studying uh, the work of Clifford Getz, and it shows how. Even when Clifford Gertz said that he was no Personian, that he had a completely different theory and framework and whatever, he was still thinking in those terms. Because yeah. that template was so strong and so deep in their way of reasoning that it, it, you can see that everywhere. So one fascinating thing uh, for me about Bella was... Um, and, you know, it, it has a lot to do with the uh, professionalization of the social sciences because, mm -hmm. you know, every science doesn't really give you back a, a, a complete image of the world. Models are simplifications, are ways to simplify reality in order to find explanations, right? And so uh, whenever you create a model, you don't, your aim is not to give a, a perfect, complete point-to-point -point image of reality, but uh, a working image of reality that lets you explain some phenomena. So, and and I think that scheme was very, very strong in doing that, even if it has been 
so much despised and nobody really uses that today but uh, well the I, function I think... well the functionalist i guess in modernization theory i mean I, this is why i reacted so horribly within my religious studies <laughs> program um, because they were taking a purely postmodern sort of deconstructive approach to everything in colonial and post-colonial take on stuff. So, but I was fascinated by, I mean, the, the Mijing restoration in Japan and what happened there because of, I mean, uh, being in Montreal, I was actually studying <clears throat> with Albert Lowe, who's, I mean, he's, he's a religious convert to, to, to Zen and within the Philip Kaplow's uh, line. So, when I was studying with him and I went back to school, I got very interested. Well, you know, how did this get transmitted to America? So, so I got fascinated in, in this whole sort of period in, in the transformation of Zen and, and Buddhism in Japan and how it eventually got exported to, to the United States and stuff like that. And I mean, to me, Robert Bella was just, you know, his work on Japan was just so powerful for me because of he was talking about the modernization of Japan and how through the process of modernization, it had also gone out and changed and evolved and transformed its religious institutions in the process. So I was completely captivated by that, <laughs> but nobody wanted to talk about it. I mean, exactly like the way you're describing, because I mean, I'm, you know, this is me in, in you know, the, the early 2000s, you know, all of a sudden trying to go out and study this phenomenon. And like you're saying, nobody wanted to talk about Parsons. Nobody wanted to talk about modernization theory. Uh, they always want to go out and take a, a sort of more sort of, well, exactly that, a postmodern sort of deconstructive approach and a fragmented approach to the study of religion, which I found so, so, so disenchanting. Um, so to me, it's fascinating to hear all these dimensions come up through your work in this biography because you lay out this history in such a juicy <laughs> and you know unbelievable personal story of of robert bella's life um so the other thing too i mean that i really got captivated with uh with robert bella's work is obviously his work on the new religious consciousness it, well, his, that particular book that he wrote about so i guess the the sort of more progressive left-wing version of of religion, I guess, in the United States. Um, so once I obviously discovered, you know, that he was experimenting with that whole counterculture in terms of his own identity and, and, and obviously his own sexuality, I find that so unbelievably um, riveting in terms of a story, right? That this was going on in the background that I did not know. So I really appreciate you <laughs> connecting some of these stories there. So, but you wrote the anthem or the companion to Robert Bella prior to writing this book. So, I mean, you'd been doing this work on Robert Bella for a long time prior to even deciding to go and write the book. Um, so, I mean, maybe you could tell me a bit about how that companion got put out first. How did you decide to write that first before doing the biography or how did it, did it land in your lap at that particular moment and stuff like that how did that come about so you know as i said um i had started working uh, on the project uh, long ago i mean uh i think the first uh the first piece that i wrote was i don't know maybe 2010 2011 and um so at some point i decided i i want to i wanted to do two parallel things so to say so on the one side i i was writing this biography and the biography uh i don't know what you think maybe you can tell me what you think because uh that is uh of much interest to me um uh, i wanted to write a book that anyone could read uh so narrative in form not too specialistic not not too many discussion on you know uh bizarre ideas or whatever and no theory okay and and that was going to be the book okay and then uh on the other side uh i decided i wanted to write a number of essays uh that i mostly published on scientific journals and disciplinary journals and each one of the essays uh is centered on some theoretical problem so i had 
you know, the more narrative book and then the sociological stuff in the articles and the essays. Gotcha. So, um, and then I was asked, uh, I, I was asked to, to edit the, the Anthem Companion. It's part of a series of similar books on different sociologists. Uh, and, um, and the funny thing was that, um, uh, but I that know. that 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 happened in I guess when Robert Bella was still alive. So you no you, no okay that was was after he had passed away in terms of even that anthem. Yeah, because the uh, the anthem came out in two thousand nineteen. I remember yeah. that clearly because I was on sabbatical and I was writing the other book. Okay, and and the book just arrived uh, in Germany where I was living at the time. Gotcha. And, uh, and I think they asked me to to do that around 2017, so well after he was gone. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, it was part of a series of books, and the other uh, subjects of other companions were, you know, so very classic sociologists who really didn't need any. Uh, legitimation or explanation like Max Weber or Durkheim or Zimmel, uh, this kind of people. And, uh, and so uh, when they asked me to do that uh, and edit the book, I had perfectly in mind who were the people that I wanted in the book because, you know, I knew the, the literature. I, I knew a lot of people uh, that had been influenced by Bella or uh, knew about him, so I, I immediately knew who was going to be in the book. Okay, gotcha. But then I thought about my introduction, and uh, and I said, I, I want to do something different. I want to do something that is not a celebration of the man, but uh, or or something to say, oh, you know, this guy was very good, and uh, he deserves a, a, a book like this. Okay. And so I asked myself the question, why does Bella deserve a book that is called The Companion to his thought? Mm -hmm. And um, and so I tried to to answer to that kind of question, which is a question of, um, how would you say, canonization, to be part of a pantheon of great thinkers, okay? And uh, because, you know, you, you told me you come from religious studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that Bella is much more famous in religious studies than <laughs> he is in sociology. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, American sociology and, and especially American sociology of religion uh, is very, very far from what he, he was trying to do in so many ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, American sociology of religion tends to be very positivistic and quantitative and they have this uh, kind of uh, obsession for uh, being scientific and look scientific because you know uh, they, they, they really uh, are worried to uh, how can I say that they don't want to to be looked at as religious people, but as scientists studying religion. Or scholars or intellectuals or public. You know, and so, <laughs> yeah. and so a guy like Bella who was uh, very, very proud of being religious and a scholar and of mixing everything. And uh, uh, for example, uh, Galen Watts had this uh, great article on a, on a journal that's called Civic Sociology about uh, sociology as public philosophy. Mm -hmm. This idea that as a uh, as a intellectual and a, and a sociologist you uh, can intervene in political moral matters and you can say something about that instead of uh, the metaphor uh, goes like having two different hats the mm -hmm. hat as a public intellectual and a hat as a scientist okay and uh, Robert Bella was. Uh, he used to say, I only have one hat and, mm -hmm. and that's me. Okay. And so, uh, he was much more famous in religious studies where this, uh, going back and forth, uh, 
science and theory and historical work and uh, more philosophy of religion. Uh, almost. Yeah, philosophy and more normative uh, um, uh, considerations and, and things is is more normal, so to say. Okay, so uh, and and you know just. To close the point, my answer was uh, that what really makes Robert Bella stand out as an intellectual is this commitment that he had to thinking through problems and living through scientific and philosophical problems. He was like a hundred percent intellectual and a hundred percent individual, so to say. It was. Uh, there was no distinction between his life and his work and his thinking and his being always uh, completely committed to, to what he was thinking and to what he was writing. So in a sense, he, he was a, a, a real professor. That is somebody who doesn't not only teach, but lives what he teaches. Oh, absolutely. So, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, that's what inspired me so much about his work as well. But it, like you said, I mean, because <clears throat> you do take in, and I love the introduction as well that you wrote for the companion as well, because it is, it's shorter, it's much more critical and takes much more of a, like, exactly like you said, a much more sociological sort of scholarly take on it. And I recommend people read that as well. <laughs> it's just, it's so good along with your biography of him because it adds another layer of, of themes and subjects that people can really go and dive into. But like the other thing too, is I find interesting about your work is that you, you studied him as a sort of uh, a case study that uh, somebody who had uh, suffered the consequences of his own success in a certain way, right? in terms of touching on these subjects. And, you know, obviously the American civil religion subject was a big one, which he got, I mean, it, it just stuck to him <laughs> for so long. And that took up so much time of his career. So he only became synonymous with that. But the other thing too, is that, I mean, through habits of the heart, he eventually kind of got associated, like you said, much more with religious studies, but not only with religious studies, I mean, because of the Shilaism, concepts that they developed in there, the, their subject of study almost became ridiculed or it wasn't viewed as a, a serious sort of subject matter to go and for sociologists or even for religious studies scholars to go and focus in on. Um, and me personally, I mean, because I mean, I, I, I was born in 77, so and I'm born in Quebec. So once I came of age, my parents were very much in that sort of mold of the countercultural sort of uh, worldview. So I grew up with people like Alan Watts and this countercultural sort of, you know, religious and, you know, the influence of East Asian studies and coming into American culture and eventually coming into Canada and stuff like that as well. Um, and I didn't know that he had a, a very deep connection with that, but he almost got smeared along those lines too. Because um, you mentioned Mike Murphy in the book and his connection to the Eslin Institute and the human potential movement. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that um, because you focus a lot more, I guess, on the civil religion aspect in terms of how he got stuck in that, but he also got smeared along those lines as well, right? In terms of not being really as serious a scholar um, because of his association with the more sort of left-leaning progressive uh, religious worldview, I guess you could say, in the United States. So I was curious how I, how you touched upon that. And uh, uh, if you could tell me a bit more about Mike Murphy, I don't know, and his connection to the Eslin Institute. I'm dying to know if there was some deep roots there in terms of his correspondences and stuff. Yeah, so um, the, the, the first thing that I, that I want to say in, in answer to this question is uh, uh, think of, uh, of an academic career just like Bella's. So he, he finished his doctorate in 1955 mm, yeah. and uh, he died in 2013. So it was almost 60 years. And the idea is how many times do you change your mind in 60 years? <laughs> you know, and, and in Bella's case, it was, I would say, at least four times. But okay. I mean, 
No changed a bit of his mind. He changed his mind big time. Okay. okay. So, and, and one of the things that I wanted to, to, to give the reader of the biography is how different were the different periods. Mm. Because the, uh, Bella's, um, uh, interest, uh, in the Tante culture has been almost forgotten today. I mean, he's famous for civil religion, he's famous for habits of the heart, he enjoyed some uh, late life uh, fame for his book on uh, religion and the evolution. But those years, and, and they are like uh, 10, 12 years around the end of the 60s and the 70s, when he was really, really into the Kanta culture and mm -hmm. had been completely uh, forgotten. And I think he wanted them to be forgotten because, <laughs> okay. yeah, they, they, they really didn't fit. Okay? okay. They really didn't fit with the image that he had as a public intellectual. Because as a public intellectual, he was like the very critical uh, religionist sometimes called the communitarian, which I think it was not in okay. any way. Uh, it was on the left. It was very socialist uh, as far as economic policies go. Mm -hmm. uh, it was apparently conservative on things like marriage or whatever, but it was for marriage for everybody, for example. Yeah. It, it, was, uh, uh, it was for gay marriage and whatever. And so... Uh, there was a part of his life uh, in the late 60s and uh, until the mid 70s, and then the five crazy years of experimentation at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s before uh, Habits of the Heart was published. In those years, he was very, very into the counterculture and he tried to put together all the pieces because. Uh, uh, all the stuff that you were talking about, Alan Watts and whatever, he knew the stuff very well, mm -hmm. but he wanted to give all this stuff a more, let's say, academic, scientific, legitimate form. So to okay. Speak. Okay. So he was struggling. It, 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 will, it would take, say, Norman Brown's work, which is completely crazy. I don't know if you ever read that. No, uh, I haven't, Norman. but I want to read it now that oh, you put uh, it in the book. You should, you should, <laughs> you should, you should. So you you you, you take uh, Norman Brown's Love's Body, such yeah. a great book. It's completely crazy. You don't understand what you read all the time, okay? But then it, it's the classic kind of book that makes you your mind think and... Uh, and opens so many avenues for thinking and feeling and experience. And, and what, what the book tells you, Eric, is completely different from what the book tells to me, you know? Okay. So it, 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 it's such good stuff. And Bella was 40 at the time. You know, oh, he was okay. born in uh, 1927. So he got to Berkeley in 1967. Exactly mm -hmm. during the summer of love, but he was forty. He was not twenty-five or twenty-two, <laughs> okay. and and he already had four daughters. So and he was a professor at the university. So you know he had this kind of uh, uh, midlife crisis together with the counterculture in Berkeley, coming from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Harvard, and. Uh, this kind of establishment of the Protestant East Coast and moved to the other side of the U.S. Yeah. in a completely different environment. It, it just got crazy, you know? And, and, and I think that the stuff that he wrote in the, from the late 60s to the late 70s is the best stuff that he wrote oh, because really? okay. it's so creative and so strange. And, uh, and also the interesting thing is that Exactly in that period, he elaborated the idea that you cannot have a single point of view on reality. You have to constantly move from one point of view to the other. So 
one point of view is the American tradition. Another point of view is, say, Zen Buddhism as it was brought from Japan to the U.S. Another point of view is the counterculture. Another point of view is whatever. Okay, so and and the most interesting thing about the habits of the heart, for example, uh, which I try to underline so many times in the book, because uh, I think that um, I mean it's pretty normal that uh, famous books and famous ideas are synthesized and reduced to some very uh, easy uh, portable kind of. Uh, ideas okay so you you have like a sketch of, of the complex idea it becomes simple uh, so that other people can criticize it and whatever but the good thing about habits of the heart is that it says that American culture is really made of four different strands that do not go along very well Okay, two kinds of individualism, two kinds of collectivism, and the point is not embracing one of these four strengths, but finding a balance between the four. Mm. And every time I read that Bella was a communitarian or was on the side of biblical culture or whatever, I say, no, that's not the answer. The guy knew that every culture is never monolithic, is never coherent. It has different traditions that are uh, somehow intertwined and uh, in a very precarious balance. And for example, Bella only wrote once about Italy, and he said that in Italy, uh, his point of view was that in Italy we have not four, but six different cultures. <laughs> and yeah that you have to strike a balance between them. And for example, in the last few months, it was very clear that he was right, for example. Yeah. No, so, I mean, and, and again, I mean, it kind of goes back as well to uh, Parsons kind of four subsystem type approach that he was taking all the time. Because because he did, I mean, and I see this quite clearly because I'm with you, you know, like in terms of him, whether was he, was he really a communitarian? And did he really go out and completely drop the American individualism and stuff like that? Um, it's very difficult to go out and pin down, right? I mean, just like, you know, it's very difficult for me to figure out whether he was, you know, purely a, a sociologist or was he really a philosopher of religion or, you know, almost even a theologian because of his interest in Paul Tillich and such like that. Um, but he got smeared, I mean, very strong or got stuck, I mean, because for a number of years on this question of civil religion and trying to disentangle this sort of uh, tension between the the collective and the individual within the American ethos and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, oh, I, I, I think it's interesting that, you, I mean, you say that, I mean, he, he tried to go out and forget or he tried to, or maybe it just kind of fell off, you know, in terms of his interest in terms of the 1960s counterculture, because the most two powerful books that had an impact on me are his Beyond Belief book. And uh, obviously his book on terms of the new religious consciousness. And, uh, and he did, or he, he, at times he almost, well, seemed to have taken a bit of a conservative turn at times, uh, or, you know, gone out and focused in a bit more on the communitarian collective side, right? The importance that we need to stay <laughs> in some sort of, uh, uh, sort of social glue in some type of way. Uh, but he was always, always very much on the left. So I guess maybe we can, I'd be curious to hear, you know, in terms of how you saw his politics, because you do touch upon it a bit. Um, but I mean, clearly to me anyways, he was a man very much of the left uh, in terms of his overall temperament. And I'm just curious to hear a bit, you know, your thoughts on that. Yeah. So it was definitely on the left. I yeah. mean, um, I would call him, uh, if is there anything like that, a leftist Aristotelian or something like that. Okay, yeah. Um, like Charles Taylor? Like like Charles Taylor. I, I, I think his politics was very close to, to Charles Taylor's. Um, and um, so 
the the answer is very complex because uh, the 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 point is what does conservative to be conservative means so uh, because for example uh, the politics of the right uh, from from the point of view of economics and capitalism uh, is what we now call neoliberalism. So it's like uh, giving uh, uh, full freedom of, uh, uh, I would say, utilitarian individualism and market forces and try to reduce the intervention of the state in, in the market. So that's what we call conservatism now. But at the same time, you know, we always have this kind of uneasy alliances between uh, traditionalists and neoliberalism, uh, people who are um, who try to give or enforce some kind of a traditional morality, and uh, I mean it's not really traditional. It's the idea of traditional morality that we have now in two thousand twenty-two. Okay, and the same is true for Italy, for example. The new mm -hmm. government that we have is partially very conservative Catholics uh, and conservative traditionalists from a moral point of view and hyper neoliberal uh, like market crazy people okay mm -hmm. and they they put together this on the other side on the left you have exactly this the the same point but flip uh, you have people who want to regulate the economy but have most individual freedom in immorality okay and so you have two strange coalitions okay and where did bella uh would locate himself nowhere in between these two coalitions because he would go for uh, state regulation of the market and very strong state intervention very strong welfare state uh, as something that the U.S. never had in their yeah. history, more closer to uh, Europe or Canada or something like that. Uh, but then at, at the same time, he was really unconvinced about the goods of expressive individualism and this kind of, uh, would you say, uh, do whatever you want and find uh, uh, your truth inside yourself, kind of things. Okay. Yeah. And well, the Sheilaism, the Sheilaism, essentially. Yeah, and that the Sheilaism. Sort of... <laughs> you know, and, and he changed his mind about yeah. that because I'm sure that in at the end of the '60s and in the mid '60s, uh, he thought that that was the way. Okay, and then he he moved. And I don't know if that's a move towards conservatism. Uh, surely it's a move towards collectivism in a sense. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, that Galen Watts' book really uh, nails the point that, mm. uh, that Bella, as many others, uh, maybe took too much at face value what these people what is expressive individualists or what Galen calls the romantic kind of liberals uh, say about themselves. Yeah. Uh, it, it didn't really see the culture that was there. He only saw the uh, self-interpretation of these people as individuals uh, without roots, without uh, strong communities and whatever. And he didn't really see that there was something there. So, yeah. uh, and, and I would agree. I mean, I was born in 1971 in Italy, which is not as diverse as Canada or the US, but uh, I would say the postmodern expressivist, romantic, whatever individualism is also my way of thinking about myself and uh, thinking about what is a good life. So, uh, and we, we, I remember when he was alive, we had discussions about that because yeah. uh, I said, Do you know, there's much more in that culture than what you see in that culture. But he never bought that. 
He never wrote yeah. that. He, 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 it was a very strictly Durkheimian from that point of view. He wanted to see strong institutions and strong networks and uh, and he, it just, well, and he's not one, the only intellectual as well to have gone out and sort of turn, not necessarily turn his back on 68. Uh, but I mean, even the Habermas and some of these other big sort of sociological thinkers and stuff like that, they've all eventually came around and said that, yeah, something went something a bit too far <laughs> in 68. Uh, and that things did go, you know, off the rails in a certain way. So so, but I mean, they're very much a, a product of that culture and that time, yet they eventually turn back reflectively to go and see maybe, um, you know, I mean, what, 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 what was good and what was bad about those particular moments and how we can actually go out and move forward. And it's funny because, I mean, him, Taylor, and obviously Habermas, I mean, are, you know, to me, the, <laughs> the biggest sorts of intellectuals out there i guess to 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 go out and wrestle with and it's it's interesting that they all sort of uh gravitated towards that sort of view that you know the 60s and the late 70s <clears throat> uh but particularly when the violence kicked in and things got really haywire that they thought something had gone maybe a bit too far there but but you know I think that in at least in Bella's case I I, I don't know because Habermas seems to me um bit softer on that but at least in Bella's case I think this kind of personal backlash or whatever what you call it uh, was really motivated because you really really was uh, was worried about capitalism and mm. the kind of uh, post-industrial uh, neoliberal capitalism that we have uh, so his preoccupation was not a kind of uh, let's look back at, at the times where life was simpler or whatever, okay? His preoccupation was that capitalism was so strong and so pervasive and so, um, how can you say, uh, hegemonic as an institution that uh, the counterculture was like uh, fighting capitalism with uh, toys, toy pistols <laughs> or toys guns, you know? Yeah, totally, it, yeah. It, it was, it, you know, something like that. He was worried that you needed strong opposition and strong institutions to go against this kind of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it was like a, a preoccupation of uh, a guy whose basic uh, framework in politics was very socialistic, okay? Yeah. And for example, there's a, um, uh, there's a page in, in my book where I, uh, where I, uh, I quote from an email that, uh, that Bella wrote to a friend and where he speaks of race baiting and gender baiting and he speaks of the politics of identity mm -hmm. and uh, and all this kind of postmodern politics uh, as a way uh, to distract attention from the real problem, and the real problem is capitalism. Yeah. So, and and that is something that I really want to to do in the future. Write a a short article, maybe, to show how. Uh, this perception of Bella as a very interpretive sociologist, cultural sociologist, uh, communitarian, whatever, uh, is wrong because at the center of his political preoccupation is capitalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, it, it's not because he was conservative that he was worried about capitalism, but the other way around. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah, so, no, for sure. Well, that, that was a bit of a, the upshot too, I guess, with my conversation with Galen as well, is that, you know, trying to make sense of this right Hegelian, not, not right Hegelian, I mean, uh, right uh, communitarian or left communitarian sort of ethos that happened during the 80s and 90s, you know, kind of post Reagan era uh, and the debates that we're having there. I mean, in a certain way, I thought it's it's interesting as well, because I mean, at the time, 
you know, when the Iraq wars popped out and everything else, I mean, my religious, not my religious consciousness, but my political consciousness didn't have a good understanding of, you know, kind of what happened in the past, particularly from the 50s, 60s and into the 70s and 80s and up through the 90s and stuff like that. So your book is just, I mean, it's just, it's fantastic of going out making sense of all these subjects and themes and issues and the debates that we're actually going out and having even today. Uh, you know, which, you know, a few articles that we actually shared on Twitter and stuff like that, that where Bella is actually resurfacing, right, to try and go out and make sense of this through either civil religion or some of his other writing. And what is the role of religion in all this? So it's, it's really interesting to, to see this happening now. So that's, I'm happy to hear that you, you got maybe another article in the pipeline to, to, to go and flesh that out a bit more. Um, so I guess my, my other question too is, um, uh, because I mean, you're purely, I mean, you're much more of a, a sociologist. So, I mean, what's your take on religion though? I mean, cause you're quite quiet, uh, I mean, that's not your formal sort of training. I mean, you're much more trained as a sociologist. So when you read Bella and his interest in religion, I'm kind of curious to hear kind of your own personal opinion on some of that, especially since you're Italian as well. <laughs> you're a completely different part of the world. You're not in America or North America. So I'm sure you have some pretty interesting uh, thoughts about, you know, his, his relationship to religion and how you view that as well. I'd be curious to hear just a few thoughts on that too. Well, you know, I, uh, I'm thinking about this um, this topic right now these days because, um, as I told you, I'm going to come into the U.S. and uh, in ten days from now, I'm going to give some kind of a conference, uh, and the title is "Civil and Uncivil Religion," and uh, I was thinking about the fact that the word, the very word "religion," is wrong. Mm. That comes as no surprise because, you, as you know, there there has been at least thirty years of theoretical reflection on the fact that uh, this word and the concept of religion uh, doesn't really help us in understanding what people do. And uh, the first thing that I would say is that uh, I would really, really like to stop talking about religion in general. Um, I, I'm much more of a barbarian in a sense, okay. and uh, in the sense that I really look at the specificity and individuality of uh, groups and organizations and denominations and whatever, and I really have a problem with these broad generalizations. Mm. Because, for example, if you say religion in the public sphere, what does it mean? What does it mean? Religion in the public sphere as a general thing doesn't really mean anything. I mean, I'm Italian. Uh, Italy is, say, 90% of the people still self-describe themselves as Catholics. Uh, religious minorities really do not exist or are not visible in any way. But can you really compare this and call this religion in the public sphere with a situation like uh, what you have in Canada or the US? I don't think you can, uh, I mean, you can compare the two situations, but you cannot do any general discourse on religion in the public sphere. And this is why the, the whole phrase about uh, post-secularism and whatever is it, really, uh, it's really annoying from my point of view because you have very, very distinct uh, traditions which are national and also subnational and infranational uh, because Italy is not the same and the US are not the same. I mean, uh, just take a look at the difference between the Bible Belt and California. Come on. And so uh, uh, the first thing that I would say, I would really, really try not to talk about religion and say politics or the public sphere in general in any way. And uh, our experience here, for example, in Italy is very interesting. There was, uh, I'll tell you a, a, a very little story. Once I was like uh, chairing some kind of a public meeting about uh, 
the Vatican, the Italian Church, and Italian politics. Okay, mm. and we are, and I, I was a kind of a, a MC for the for the night, and then we had a very famous political scientist and a very famous Catholic priest talking, and then. At some point, I, I open a question and answer uh, part of the night. And then a guy uh, says something like, uh, you know, I was a Catholic once, but since the Catholic Church has become so conservative and so aggressive in the, in the public sphere, I had no other choice and I am not a believer anymore. And then I had this microphone in my hand and I said, uh, can I ask you a question? Why didn't you be, why didn't you just switch churches and become a Protestant or a Methodist or whatever? Mm, yeah. All the people in the room went something like, ooh, <laughs> because in Italy, you cannot think about that, right? And after the, the meeting was over, the organizer of the meeting came to me and said, you're not going to make fun of the people anymore. You want to share anything again in my place because you are making fun of the people. I oh, said, wow. What does it mean? I, I, I was just asking why these people say they stop to be believers instead of finding another church. This is something very normal in yeah. other places and in other countries, you know? Mm -hmm. And everyone in that room in Bologna, Italy, and Bologna is the place where I live, is the most leftist place in Italy, okay? <laughs> okay, yeah. Nobody was even thinking about that. Wow. That looked like I, I, I was making fun of the people. So you understand what I mean? You, you, you cannot really speak in general about these matters because traditions are so different and the way we have uh, to think about traditions and options and what does it mean I mean uh, try to be <laughs> try to be uh, uh, a Sheila in Italy <laughs> explain it <laughs> you to your Catholic in-laws yeah get best come on luck. <laughs> come on come on God, no, they, so. obviously, I could only imagine. No, I mean, I mean, I'm from Quebec as well, so I mean, I'm Catholic by by origin, but I mean, in terms of French secularism, is so unbelievably oppressive and it's problematic for a lot of people. I mean, and most of my Anglophone friends and people like that are much more uh, progressive. I mean, it, it eventually turns into this sort of question of spirituality. It's no longer a question of religion. Um, but and some of the differences as well, I think, in terms of, you know, on the left and on the right and how we talk about religion or spirituality is, is a hugely contested sort of issue. Um, and I hear you on the, uh, the secular question, right? I mean, how does religion or spirituality now and go out and fit in into the public sphere and how, what kind of an impact it has on politics uh, is very difficult to go out and talk about. <laughs> Uh, and it's almost impossible for people to go out and completely separate these, you know, and fragment their lives out in a certain way around some of these subjects as well, which makes it even more contentious. Um, so, I mean, that to me is uh, really an interesting question too, because I mean, the, the political climate now too, I mean, just to speak a bit more about maybe about the political climate a bit more, I mean, because this idea of the new right or the new sort of Christian nationalism that's kind of spreading across Euro some parts of Europe, uh, and obviously in some parts of North America and uh, even now in Canada and stuff like that um, is very different than, you know, uh, I think if Bella was alive in terms of how he would go and be talking about Christianity within the West, you know, from a sort of left wing perspective. And those voices are not as strong right now without obviously Bella being there. I mean, Charles Taylor is also <laughs> aging quite significantly in terms of, you know, kind of flagging out that side of the, you know, of the political spectrum. And I mean, speaking of Habermas as a sort of intellectual, I mean, he was, you know, kind of talking or trying to push this sort of post-secular worldview, whatever that means. And that seems to have died or fallen on some pretty hard times these days. Um, 
So, but obviously you've been thinking, you are thinking quite a bit about this as well as you're witnessing everything around right now in terms of the political climate. Uh, so what do you think is, what do you think Bella would be thinking about our historical moment now politically? Or how would he be reacting, you think? So in a sense, uh, when he was alive, he, ten he tended to downplay the, uh, let's say, evangelical, white nationalist stuff and everything. Mm. Um, because again, uh, he thought that it was much more a question of neoliberalism and a kind of a, uh, religious and moral companion to that than, a um, how can I say, than, a an autonomous phenomenon, so, so to say, so, yeah. Uh, I don't want to say that it was a kind of ideology of that, or uh, as Galen says in the book, a kind of a sacralization or re-enchantment of a, a neoliberal mentality. But yeah, we're close to that, okay? Yeah. Uh, my idea is that uh, this kind of uh, uh, Christian nationalism and whatever, uh, for example, in Italy, it, it is so clear, and I think that it, it, it's quite clear also in the US, uh, is that most of politicians, both on the left and the right, and when I say the left, I mean uh, something like the American Democratic Party or something like that, which is not really leftist uh, in the 20th century political spectrum, so to say. Uh, you see, from a, uh, economic policy point of view, uh, nobody really sees an alternative to neoliberalism. Uh, that seems like something you cannot change in any way. Uh, like there is no alternative to this kind of neoliberalism, uh, bowing to financial capital and whatever. And so the politics shift to some more moral identity problems that can be used as flags uh, uh, exactly in the same moment that we don't know and we do not do anything from an economic point of view because there is no alternative. Yeah. You know, in Italy, this is so clear. Uh, for example, the new government that just uh, was sworn in. Mm -hmm. it, it is the, um, so, you know, today is October 28th. It's the 100th anniversary of Mussolini going to Rome and asking the king to form a government. Okay. So this is a very bad day for Italy. And uh, uh, some days ago, a new right-wing government uh, got sworn in. And uh, all these people where originally, I mean, when those parties were created in the 50s and the 60s, uh, those were very nationalist, the strongly nationalist, uh, fascist parties that from an economic point of view were in favor or, of a very strong welfare state, okay? Mm. Very strong welfare state. But today, they embraced completely the neoliberal idea of economic policy. And yeah. so they are talking a lot about morality and traditional family and traditional Christian values because they cannot, they cannot really act in the economic policy. You know what I mean? So the whole political struggle is on that field of morality and values uh, and whatever because everything else is taken so to yeah say. and well and, and again i mean back to uh talcott parsons in terms of his four kind of you know subsystems and stuff like that i mean the cultural versus the institutional socioeconomic realm right i mean the the more public sphere rather than the internal cultural um, and I'm with you on that because the new right or whatever we want to go out and call it, I mean, they're all fixated on this idea of identity and culture 
yet they're not willing or they can't go and address, you know, what the left is usually referring to as the sort of social economic action system that we need to go out and exactly. heal, right? So there's this big fragmented side where either they're talking well, past each other <laughs> and very few people, I think, are taking, you know, a sort of... Uh, for you know almost an integral sort of perspective on you know on this this reality that we're going out and facing um and i i, I just you know because uh, now that robert bella is back in my mind and i've been revisiting so much of his work uh you know i like i you know at times i feel like you know it'd be so great to see another sort of intellectual capable of going out and and addressing you know all of these these subjects and themes I mean, so beautifully in his work, right? I mean, he was able to go out and and take all these perspectives into account and stuff like that in terms of how he he wrote and he, how he spoke and how he was in public and stuff like that. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, thank you for 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 thinking or clarifying. I think how you think he would be reacting, he would be much more focused on the economic dimension. You think at this point, rather than just the the cultural and identitarian sort of questions that the right is raising. Um, so I guess the other thing too that I'd love to go and finish up on is because uh, since we talked a bit about, I mean, the, the articles as well. I'll make sure that I post these uh, in the description because these these articles uh, that were written for the uh, Civic Sociology uh, Journal, I mean, they're fantastic uh, articles to go and read, um, you know, in tandem with your book, but also going out and touching upon a lot of the subjects that we're going out and talking about. And I mean, we really did go out and touch quite a bit, I guess, in terms of his work, in terms of um, particularly Chad Goldberg's article, uh, in terms of uh, Robert Bella and the legacy in time of trial, because we are really facing a big, you know, trial moment in our history. So revisiting Bella right now is uh, a great way, I think, to go out and uh, try and make sense of things. Um, so I'll put that in there, but I I'd like to end maybe... Uh, on his ideas around evolution uh, and religion. And I'd be curious to, uh, to kind of uh, see what you think in terms of, you know, his so-called magnus opus, whether you think it really is his magnus opus and uh, how, you know, his, his last work will go out and be remembered, I guess, moving forward. Because, I mean, there's some big endorsements there of people about the book. But again, I mean, speaking about evolution, and particularly our moment here in terms of human evolution and talking about religion, I uh, can go out and raise some pretty big flags <laughs> for a lot of people. Uh, so I'd be curious to see, you know, uh, your thoughts on that, that his, his last book and some of the stuff that he was writing about it in terms of at the end of his life. Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, you know, as I, as I reconstruct in my book, um, Bella decided he wanted to write such a book about the uh, evolution and religion in the mid fifties when it was like uh was like thirty and uh for a, a series of unfortunate events uh, so to say he, he was not able to start working seriously on the book until the late nineties when he was seventeen. So, uh, I think in the meantime, the, uh, obviously the centrality and the significance and the meaning of the relationship between religion and evolution changed a lot. Mm. And, uh, and the book has been very much criticized because you don't really understand what he's talking about when he talks about evolution. Seems like, um, uh, what would you call it, like an empty signifier or something like that. Mm, so, yeah. like something that is floating around the book like a ghost, but you never get a theory of evolution, for example. You know, you, you don't find a theory of, of evolution. And uh, all you find are uh, kinds of societies and kinds of religions and so you don't have the process of evolution. You only have like stages of evolution, which is very different because you don't learn in the book how you move from one stage to the other. 
But my idea was that is that in fact, uh, Bella was really, really seriously committed to the idea of evolution for at least two reasons. The first reason, as he repeatedly wrote in the in those years at the end of the uh, on the two thousands, is that evolution is the only grand narrative that is left. Uh, if you think um, of okay. uh, progress or I don't know, the victory of communism <laughs> or yeah. rationality or the spirit of the world, uh, Hegel and everything, the only grand narrative that survived uh, postmodernism and the 70s and the 80s is evolution. Mm. And what you really wanted to do was to connect the humanities and the social sciences with this grand narrative of evolution in the natural sciences. You wanted to give some kind of a whole picture of everything, okay? And the, the, the other, the second reason, the other intuition is this. You wanted to show that while everything is connected, in fact, the book starts with the Big Bang. And uh, some of the reviews, especially um, a book review that was published on the New York Times, so it was pretty much important and influential as far as the interpretation of the book went, uh, said, why should he start from the Big Bang? What, what, is he, what does it really add to my knowledge of human religion? Mm -hmm. to know about the Big Bang and eukaryotes and biology and whatever. And the point is that Robert Bella was trying to create a new myth. Is not writing in a strictly scientific um, uh, discourse or a strictly scientific frame. Because what he wants to say in that book is that you cannot have science without stories and you can't have stories without myths and you can't have myths without performing myths without people talking about them debating about them uh telling narrate myths to the others uh, in a sense is trying to say that the scientific point of view is never enough you have to complete the scientific point of view with something that is more, uh, would you use the ad adjective irrational? Uh, I would say symbolic. I would say uh, holistic. I would say uh, something that connects things that modern science has divided and differentiated. So, I, and, and that's why I think you're right in saying that uh, probably uh, Bella was mostly a theologian uh, and um, I remember that at least uh, one um, one Catholic priest wrote a review of the book saying that with this book Bella was the most important uh, pro liberal Protestant theologian of the 20th century okay but why is that because it's not is not writing sociology, is writing like a whole great interpretation of everything. And he has to start. Or a new creation Bang. story almost. Exactly. Because yeah. he, want, he, he wants to tell you that everything is connected. And so if everything is connected, I cannot leave anything out. You know, it's, it's, it's more than an argument. It's more than a scientific argument. It's performative. I'm telling you a very long story and I have to start from the beginning because the story is only one story. You yeah. cannot start elsewhere. That, that's the idea. And that's why the, the book is not sociology of religion. And that's why sociologists of religion read the book and said, oh, what are we going to do with this book now? <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's, it's it's not that the way and also uh let, let me say another another thing which i think is very very important is also a very personal book uh, mm. 
as I show in, in my book, uh, Bella's religion in human evolution is full of moments where he speaks in the first person. Yeah. And that's, that's not because he was old and he was cuckoo and he wanted to put himself into the picture because he was in the picture because yeah. everyone is in the picture you know it's a story that reads as a story of the universe of mankind and of every single individual who's part of mankind yeah. so we can agree with him or not but i think that the book only makes sense if you look at the book from this very uh, I would say holistic point of view, which brings us back to the counterculture in a sense, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I mean, because because I mean, so many people are into. I mean, this is something I've covered in my podcast as well. Like, I'm fascinated by so many people that are really interested in terms of German idealism, particularly people on the left, right? That there's this almost like the left rails against the right, saying that they're so you know, retro romantic, that they're longing for a past that was never there. And that yet you know, I'm seeing all these people on the left that are like longing for the days when German idealism was a thing and Hegel was still around. So, and I'm like, oh my God, like, can we talk about like evolution at least? Like we're not. So th this is why I think <laughs> when, when I read Bella or when I inter interact with my more philosophically minded friends or people that I've had on the podcast, I mean, Right, they, they don't want to go out and talk about evolution either because the minute you raise the question of evolution, you know, for a leftist, they, you know, these their antennas go off. Says, are you talking about eugenics? Are you talking about some sort of, you know, uh, uh, new new form of fascism in terms of evolution and stuff like that? So I'm a bit scared as well, kind of like how Bella's, you know, his entities past and how his Bork will go out and be remembered. Uh, in a certain way but like you said i mean his he, he wrote he was writing this in the 90s which was a completely different moment in history which was you know there was a bit of idealism still left in the pipeline i think prior to 2008 at least <laughs> so i'm not sure if he was trying to keep the pipeline or hope alive as he was finishing off his days <laughs> but but you know uh, also there's another thing that i think is very important uh, uh Bella's ideas of evolution is that our capacities and um, are connected. So, uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, there are uh, some things that animals can do, and what we can do as humans uh, with language and culture whatever kind of theoretical mind we have builds on the capacities and what animals can do and so in this sense is evolutionism is a way to connect everything to keep everything connected and so it is in a sense it's exactly the opposite of uh, eugenics or uh, say biological fascism or anything like that is a way to say that everything is much more connected than it seems and that we don't have the right to uh, dispose of everything or use everything or uh, for example the, the last thing that he was writing when he died he, he was trying to write a book on modernity and that that was so much um on the side of the ecolo uh, how do you say uh, ecological politics? How do you say that in English? Yeah. Uh, much more uh, an environmental perspective. Yeah, on modernity. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So deeply, uh, this kind of deep environmentalism, because that was really his fear. And in in the last pages that he wrote before dying. He had this idea of neoliberal capitalism destroying the environment and destroying the planet and everything on it. So I think that the, the main uh, image that we have to think when, when we think of uh, evolution in Bella's term is like a, a connection of everything that there is instead of uh, we are the 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 most important uh species in the world and we do whatever we want you know 
Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, and, yeah. I mean, his work to me, I mean, doesn't speak to me on that level, but I guess it's a bit of a fear of mine that, you know, how people can go out and cancel people, <laughs> I guess, for certain writings and stuff like that. But I mean, his, his grand narrative, I mean, the other thing too, is that is so, I find so amazing is that he weaved in his interest in terms of modernization or I guess Eisenstadt's theory of, you know, multiple modernities. Uh, so I, you know, like I, I would have loved to him to go out and write his book on modernity because I think it would have been such an interesting continuation of his writing on the actual age and civilizations and stuff like that. Um, and even I would have loved, oh, maybe I could even ask you this is that, I mean, cause obviously Huntington wrote the clash of civilizations and he's talking about civilizations as well and multiple modernities. And I know Bella would not. He's, he would not be along those lines in terms of, you know, subscribe to this inevitability that since there are multiple modernities and we're seeing the rise of, you know, multiple uh, modern civilizations that we're, we're doomed to, to face some sort of clash of civilizations. Uh, but I guess I'd be curious to hear kind of your thoughts on that too. Uh, you know, because I mean, I'm a big fan of Fred Dalimar as well, where he talks about the, the dialogue of civilizations rather than the clash of civilizations. And his work is so, I mean, uh, hopeful and I mean, unbelievable scholar as well for me. I would have loved to see him in, <laughs> in conversation with Fred, uh, you know, Dalimar or even Habermas towards, you know, as these men are aging to go and talk about some of these works that, that they're trying to finish at the end of their lives is, uh, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that in terms of multiple modernities and civilizations and where you thought, where he was going so, with his book on evolution along those lines. Yeah, sure. Do you know, in his work on, on Japan, uh, already in the 50s, uh, Bella compared Japan with continental Europe, the US and China yeah. and said that these four uh, regions, so to say, had developed different modernities. So he was on the concept, uh, even without the word multiple modernities, uh, since the fifties and since, since the very beginning of his, um, reflection on, on these matters. So, uh, he was surely, um, it was surely on that side, but his work in the nineties and, um, and the, and the 2000s was exactly meant to, to go against uh, Huntington and the uh, clash of civilizations. And that was because Bella was uh, continued to be really, really convinced that one point of view is never enough. Uh, do you remember I told you some, some time ago that he developed this idea of multiple point of view? Mm, so, yeah. Uh, one of the things, one of the reasons he wrote about the actual age and about different modernities was that he thought that no tradition is enough because other tradition, and, and this is more than a dialogue. Okay. It's the idea that, uh, he used to say what a Confucian knows uh, is something that myself as a Christian don't really know, or I don't really understand. So, uh, his experience or her experience is so important to me because lets me see the world from another point of view. Mm, and that is yeah. true for, uh, a Muslim that is true for an atheist that is true for anyone else. Okay. And so the Bella's idea was that you should move from one point of view to the other continuously. You mm. can never be still, you can never stop inside your own shoes, because if you do that, you only have one point of view about reality and that is wrong because there's so much you cannot see, uh, so much you cannot see from a cognitive point of view, but also from a moral point of view and also from a symbolic point of view. Yeah. Uh, when you, and, and, and that's the main answer that Bella would give to people like Huntington mm. and you know, it, and it's very close to Habermas and Taylor's, I think, but it's more radical. Yeah. Uh, it's more radical because you really thought, and, and uh, 
and if you read the the the, the part of the book on uh, religion and human evolution on the actual age uh, you see that how difficult it is for bella to find a single definition of the actual age uh, to find a model for the actual age to find the blueprint for the actual age because he says we have four different cases each one is different from the others and it's only by moving from one to the other continuously that we can really see what we're talking about. Yeah. So, and, and, and that again, and, uh, and I'm very obsessed with that, uh, that again is a legacy of the counterculture, mm. of the idea that we should be open to other points of view, to the coming of the East to the West, for example, and uh, non-dualistic modes of thinking, and the idea, uh, take for example, I don't know, Chinese philosophy and the idea that that life is a process and you don't have uh, things and its senses, but you always have a process of something changing into something different. Absolutely. Morphing into something different and morphing into its opposite and then its opposite again. You know, that's the idea you should always move. You can never stay still in your shoes. And that's, I think, uh, from a moral point of view, and uh, uh, even more than a moral, I would say in a, a practical, a practical yeah. attitude to live your life, that is maybe the most important thing that Bella said. Mm. Well, I mean, and I find that so inspiring as well. I mean, even more. I mean, it's an, almost an updated evolutionary and Hegelian sort of view of humanity, right? Um, and so much more dynamic in terms of, I mean, he's not just saying it's, you know, it's one, you know, kind of the West against the rest. It's, it's just, we need this plurality of all these civilizations and dialogue where there's this cross fertilization that's feeding into, you know, this theological possibly development of humanity or even evolution. Uh, and I, 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 to me, if I think along evolutionary lines, to me, it's much more plausible to, instead of readopting a sort of you know, teleological sort of view that we're, sure. you know, we're, we're it's a, it's a line of progress towards better progress all the time, but evolution can go wrong, right? <laughs> can go wrong. <laughs> Very horribly it wrong. Can. Yeah, so, sure. uh, but no, I mean, and th that's how I view his work as well. And that's, what's been inspiring me, you know, I mean, I wish that would have come out while I was still completing my religious studies degree uh to you know to hopefully see what kind of an influence i would have gone had in in academia um but i mean thank you so much for your time i mean this has been amazing um and uh i hope your trip to to north america goes well as well and i mean i can't wait to see what else you got in the pipeline um i mean i know galen's coming up with some new work as well and you're going to be i think you're going to be responding to these articles as well in the uh the journal of civil sure okay so, I mean, yeah, I sure. look forward I, to seeing all of that as well. And uh, uh, thank you so much for your work. I mean, to me, it's it's inspiring and it's hopeful and it's keeping Robert Bella alive and in my neck of the woods. So, uh, and he's just a huge inspiration for me. So. Oh, well, thank you for your kind words. And uh, I, I, I hope that um, that people just enjoy reading the book as I enjoyed writing it. Uh, even if it was a very long, uh, <laughs> very long writing, but, uh, yeah. Well, and, and I mean, uh, hats off to you too. I mean, if people listening as well, I mean, Matteo, his first language is not English people. So he wrote this all in English. He's communicating with me in English right now. Uh, so th I mean, that to me is just an inspiration as well. I mean, the fact that you slugged away at this book for so many years to go and get this but, done is... Unbelievable. Uh, can I end? Can yeah. I end with us a very small polemical slash political thing? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, so I've been very lucky in my life because I, I got tenured in Italy when I was 29. Oh, wow. And, okay. Uh, yeah. And my academic condition has always been very, very different from the academic condition of today. Uh, today's people who like... Uh, had their PhD four or five or 10 years ago, yeah. where they have uh, this very competitive system with a lot of uh, um, agent work that never gets into tenure and everything. 
And uh, I would like to say that I would have never been able to write such a book uh, from Italy in English and get this kind of contract with a major academic publisher and whatever if I had to endure the conditions of academic work today. Mm. Uh, and I think that Bella was also very lucky because he could make a lot of mistakes because he was tenured and he was safe uh, in his job and he could try to explore a lot of different things and uh, start to different projects and then leave them along the way because it, it, they didn't work and whatever hmm. and so uh let me end with this uh uh if you want to if you want to think uh, good ideas and big ideas, you need time and you mm. need security. And today's academia is not made for that. Wow. And, uh, yeah. um, and, and I really, really admire people uh, like Gaynor Watts, for example, who wrote a terrific book and uh, that would have taken me five years uh, and in a in a situation where I didn't have tenure, I, I don't know if I would have ever been able to do that. So, mm. uh, and that's another uh, piece of the neoliberal order of today, which I don't really like. Yeah, no, and I mean, thank you for that as well. I mean, because, I mean, it is, I mean, academic work today is very precarious for a lot of people, particularly graduate students that, you know, um, so thank you for, for bringing that up as well uh, and highlighting that. And I mean, that's another aspect too that comes out quite uh, beautifully in your work as well is that these networks that were maintained, which is something we didn't really talk about, right? I mean, how were they able to go and maintain these these social networks of you know high scholarship during these periods and stuff like that where, I mean, they had a lot of money to go out and do a lot of this research. Right. And that's something that we did not go out and talk about very much, but which is part of your work as well, because I know you studied the uh, the sociology of prestige and success as well as another dimension that you like to go out and keep a a critical eye on. So thank you for that. Right. That, that you know bringing me back to the critical lens on that too as well that we need to remain the uh, pretty vigilant in terms of what type of scholarship and stuff that we're reading as well, right. because that's another great article too, that, I mean, I'll end on that too, here in terms of, you know, Robert Bella, was he a cold war socialist, which is a great article as well to go out and try to figure out and raise because, you know, he is a product of the 1950s and he lived through the seventies and the cold war and stuff like that. And where he shot the fame. So it's another different uh, lens to go out and study Bella as well. So thank you so much for that too. Thank you. Yeah. And to be continued, I'd love to be in touch. Thank you so much for your sure. time.